It's always interesting that uh, such meetings are held on Friday and Saturday, and uh, you have to take time off from your practice and, and everything else that you do. That's a, that's a Use this? That's a fake camera mic. Okay. <laughs> that's a fake camera mic. Okay, <laughs> there we go. That's a good start, yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, it's great and, uh, that you take the time off to come and visit with us because I think at the end of the day, I'm hoping that um, what we could add is substance to what Letitia ended with and that is at the end of the day, most of you in the medical profession or in the health uh, profession, what you really want to do, despite all these business aspects of the business and everything else, that you really want to sincerely provide quality care. And that is impinging right now because of all the things that are happening in the world that your ability to provide quality care is really being discounted and, and rapidly diminishing. And Letitia also mentioned another point regarding supplementation. That's a worrisome thing in your world because you really are not sure what, when your patient comes to you and present a product to you, you're really not quite sure how you're going to advise the person. And that, that adds adds on to your angst and in fact every week when you pick up your New England Journal you see another article on why supplements are really bad for your patients and so on and so forth. Particularly focusing on this technology that we call the biophotonic scanner and uh, we'll explain some of the science to you so that you have a level of comfort that fundamentally what we're trying to do is really answer the question how do you really know whether your supplements work or not. At the very least, or at the very minimum, when you leave here, you will have some idea at least we can measure. Because when you talk about science, you really don't talk about science. Science is really about measuring. Science is actually about basing your conclusions on data. Regardless of what field of science you come into, it's really all about measurement, isn't it? So, and that's what we are trying to, that's what we are trying to do with the scanner. I was back in Hopkins uh, visiting uh, a friend of mine back there, and he obviously is an academic, in uh, academic medicine. And um, he was telling me, boy, you know, even in academic medicine, we are being bombarded with all these questions regarding supplementation as well. And I sat down with this friend of mine, whom I postdoc, oh gosh, more than 30 years ago, before I joined the drug industry, that uh, he, he actually thought that this was a good idea as well. So it is comforting to me that even uh, a friend who pulls no punches managed to see the scanner as a viable uh, technology in our world. So let's go through this very quickly. Fundamentally, Pharmanax in 1995 was co-founded, and I was one of the co-founders, um, uh, together with another buddy of mine by the name of Michael Chang. He was trained, and he still thinks he is, a medicinal chemist. <laughs> And Michael worked in a company whom all of you should be familiar with, and that company was Merck. And uh, he was really responsible for their drug discovery programs. And on the other side of the fence, I was responsible for drug discovery at another drug company called Wyeth. And I sort of participated in, and worked in that company close to about 11 years, and over that period of time, uh, I actually sort of contributed to the development of rapamycin, which is now the anti-rejection drug, and also to another non-steroidal by the name of a total ag, and then finally another uh, photodynamic therapy drug that's called uh, sort of B BOPP, which is specifically a selective brain tumor uh, destroying type of chem molecule, which when you give it intravenously, it goes into tumor cells and not to the normal regular brain cells, and when you activate the light at a particular wavelength, it actually generates free radicals to destroy that tumor cell. So it's fascinating. And, but fundamentally, we got together with Michael and I, and we decided to really focus on natural products and natural ingredients to start this company that we call uh, Pharmanax. And one of the first uh, scientific advisory uh, advisors that we consulted with is this Professor Carl Girassi. And he was a Stanford chemist professor. He started, in fact, he was a co-founder of Syntax, which right now it doesn't exist anymore in the Bay Area because it's now part and parcel of Roche. And once again, he has lots of experience. And, and sort of when we told him about our idea of starting a company uh, based on the premise of converting and translating natural ingredients into dietary supplements, he sort of thought, well, it's a good thing. 
but make sure you don't develop snake oil. Fundamentally, you know, use what you have learned in the pharmaceutical industry, i.e. good manufacturing practices, you know, double-blind clinical studies and so on, all the things that you should do to make sure that you can substantiate that your product is safe and effective. Because if you look at it, if you in fact one day meet a physician or a healthcare provider, you will be expected to at least assure that individual that he is not going to, going to do any harm. Fundamentally within your Hippocratic oath, you know, there's this phrase about doing no harm. And at that point in time, back in 95, the supplement world was fraught with this risk and essentially, you know, infused with snake oil and all sorts of supplements that don't meet the required standards of safety and efficacy. Because it's all a matter of ground up leaves being encapsulated, putting, putting into a bottle, and then slapping on a nice looking label and call that a dietary supplement. And we didn't want to start Pharmanax with that premise, but actually overturn the apple cart, if you will, and say, why don't we do it a better way and essentially focus Pharmanax on making pharmaceutical grade science-based supplements. That's how we started Pharmanax. So we started that in 1995 and raised about $46 million from three fairly sophisticated investors group. And that would be Fidelity, whom you all know. They're located in Boston, one of the largest, if not the largest mutual fund company. And they had a venture arm. We raised money from the Pritzker family, who owns the uh, Hyatt Hotel chain, one of the richest family in Chicago. And then the third one was J.H. Whitney, which to us was actually far more impressive than the other two, because J.H. Whitney was, is the oldest venture capital group in this country. If you look at the history of venture capital, you would see that J.H. Whitney was a pioneer in venture capital. He actually fi funded the railroad in the United States way back. So they, were, they, they have many, many years of funding startups. And for them to come in, based on this story of making pharmaceutical grade science-based supplements, uh, or was it appealing enough for them to invest in a company, was a bit of a uh, reassurance for us that we are, maybe we are on the right track. And then in 1997, we launched uh, five products. And then uh, in 38,000 stores in the traditional mass market channel, that would be Walmart, Walgreens, Rite Aids of the world. And then in 1998, we got acquired by New Skin Enterprises for roughly around $135 million. And that was the portal, if you will, that how I came into New Skin Enterprises. And I continued to learn about this business. And what we brought into New Skin Enterprises is this reality of making pharmaceutical grade supplements, this R&D engine, if you will, this ability to use science to translate what we know from all the historical documents about natural ingredients and how those ingredients, if we use the modern scientific method, we perhaps could actually add value to those ingredients. And we did that through this process that we call the success process. It's just an acronym. It describes the six steps that we use to manufacture and finally launch a dietary supplement in this company. Okay. And if you look at it, I won't go through each of those steps, but fundamentally, if you look at it, what we want to make sure that we do not use garbage. Because no matter how good your process and how good your science is, if you put in garbage in, you are going to get garbage out at the other end. So we wanted to make sure, as I said, through this success process, we wanted to make sure at the very minimum that our supplements are safe. It doesn't contain any toxic contaminants. We do not adulterate our products with steroids. We do not, we analyze our products with banned substances. All the things that we would think, you know, in this 21st century that every company would be doing. Unfortunately, it is not the case. And you will hear many companies saying they're doing science, and it's difficult to really believe that particular claim because science in this day and age is really about using a multidisciplinary approach. It is about having close to about 100 scientists in the company, which we have currently, to be able to cover all the various scientific disciplines. 
we cannot just have chemists in our company because they don't know much in, in terms of biology or vice versa. So as you can see here, we have a whole array of scientific expertise in the company and this is really the R&D engine that I'm talking about. And uh, in fact, frankly, I'm really the mouthpiece for these guys. The, you ought to be meeting them and you ought to be speaking to them because don't take my word for it. Fundamentally, these are the folks who help to develop our products in New Skin Enterprises. And we do that in three R&D centers around the world. As you know, that the, uh, the Chinese, in general, they have a very rich tradition, this so-called traditional Chinese medicine uh, philosophy. And what we find from it is the fact that, yes, they have, and in fact, it's quite well documented. They actually have the first original uh, pharmacopoeia, if you, will, if you will, written in Chinese. And we have lots of experts in Chinese, they're scientists, they're trained in Western science, but they are very able to access that knowledge and then sort of pull out the gems, the, the insights that these folks had way back and see whether we can use the scientific method to translate that to something meaningful in this day and age of modern science. And that's why we have two R&D centers. Uh, in China, the one in Beijing primarily focuses on clinical and biological studies, and the one in Shanghai is uh, the R&D center focusing on making sure that when we source raw materials from China, at least we know that raw materials are, intent, are, are pure and we get it in the form that we want, uh, we bought it for. You know, we give them specs, and in general, I just don't trust the Chinese. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons why I have an R&D center in <laughs> Shanghai. So that's what we have. And we, we, we're not proud, frankly. In spite of the fact we have the multidisciplinary team here, we do not suffer from the so-called NIH syndrome, i.e. this non-invented here syndrome. We do have access to a variety and a plethora of scientists around the world and institutions. This is just an example of some of the universities we've worked with, ranging all the way from the United States to Asia and to Europe as well. And these are world experts, and many of them have contributed to the understanding and how we should develop a particular product. And just to name drop a bit more, this is our motley crew of scientific advisors. And again, I just highlighted two of them. One, uh, Koji Nakanishi from Colombia. He helped us to develop our product called BioGinkgo. And then on the right, on a post stage stem uh, issued by Austria, that is Professor Carl Gerasi. And again, officially, he likes to be known as the father of the oral contraceptive pill. Uh, I find that an oxymoron, but I've said it, and uh, you just need to think about it, how you can put those two terms together. <laughs> And just to add on, because we are now moving into the world of genes and how genes are influencing our, uh, our, how we function and who we are. Because since 2003, uh, with the, uh, the mapping of the human genome, uh, we think well, this is where the way to go. This is revolutionizing the world of medicine and the world of uh, natural product uh, development as well. And because of that, interest and focus going forward. We have brought an additional three more uh, SAB members onto the board. And the first two, starting from the left, is Richard Weindrich, Professor of Medicine at Wisconsin. In the middle is Tom Prada. These are the co-founders of a company. And if you Google, uh, you will find them. This, uh, they started a company, a biotech company, called LiveGen Technologies. And we are collaborating with them very actively to develop our so-called H-Lock products going forward. And then finally, Stuart Kim uh, comes to us from Stanford, and he understands the aging process at the genetic level in depth. And he's one of the pioneers, if you will, in uh, using genetic analysis of the aging process. So these are our, we continue to, to invigorate, if you will, and refresh our SAB with new knowledge, with new expertise. The company, it is what it is. It is New Skin Enterprises. And frankly, 13 years ago, when I got into this discussion of acquisition, my first personal reaction, since I was in Los Angeles, Farmers was actually located in the Los Angeles area, my first reaction was, well, was this company New Skin? 
you may experience the same reaction. In fact, you would think, you know, it can't be a real company, right? It can't spell new. <laughs> Let alone being in Utah. So, <laughs> however, it is obviously, again, if you use the Google, you will find that we are indeed a New York Stock Exchange publicly traded company. And the reason why that's important for all of you is because we have to be transparent being a publicly traded company. Unlike many of the privately held uh, companies in this world, they do not expose what they do in-house financially or otherwise to you. We have to. And that transparency ought to be, you know, add on to your level of comfort that, that, that we do adhere to the highest standards of uh, reputation or else all of us will go to jail. Well, the managers will. The scientists will probably find another job. So. <laughs> okay, here's the scanner. Let me quickly go through this scanner because it's a fascinating thing. We developed the first version in 2003, and the two inventors, the patent that we have exclusively licensed, uh, this scanner technology, uh, are uh, Professor Werner Gellerman and his colleague Robin McLean. They are faculty members at the University of Utah, Department of Physics, and they sort of really, back in 2003, managed successfully to use a very sensitive physical law called Raman spectroscopy to measure certain types of antioxidants. That's really what the patent was all about. And initially, they focused this technology on developing an instrument that can actually analyze the retina by shining some non-damaging laser light onto the back of the eye because the retina evolutionary has evolved because it receives so much light and because of the light, although the light coming in is good because that's how you see, but the problem is during the, when the light hits the retina, it also has the potential to generate free radicals. So the retina has evolved to a place where now it's highly enriched. That part of the eye is highly enriched with these antioxidants called carotenoids. That's how those carotenoids are there in the retina to, real, to neutralize the free radicals when light hits that part of the uh, tissue. Okay? So that's why Werner went after the, uh, the retina and see whether he can use uh, Raman spectroscopy to see whether he has any uh, diagnostic ability to detect AMD, macular degeneration, at, at the early onset before it becomes symptomatic. So, but with that, when we started to chat with him, we decided to actually say move away from the eye because our distributors are not very careful when they shine things on the eye. <laughs> so we didn't think it was commercially viable for our world. So we say, why don't we go to another piece of tissue that's a bit less risky, and that would be the skin, and see whether we can use the same instrumentation to detect these types of antioxidants on the skin. And we managed to do that. That's the, where the pattern is. And what we find again and again, uh, that is a very sensitive uh, way of detecting skin carotenoids. When we started at the very beginning, the scanner back in 2002, 2003, it actually looked like a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> That's the picture on the, on the top left. In fact, if George Bush had come here, he would have continued his presidency, but he didn't. So <laughs> anyway, so here's the weapon of mass destruction back in 1999. And then in 2003, we managed to reduce the size of it. Obviously, we, we couldn't launch that uh, room full of uh, cables running all over the place. But by 2003, we successfully converted that technology and put it into this toaster size uh, unit called the biophotonic scanner. That is a picture of the first scanner we produce. Now, with that, we have now reached a point. This is almost like the third version that we call the Everest version or edition. And this is what we're using right now in, uh, today uh, for all our distributors and everybody else to measure antioxidants. It's very small. It's very reproducible. It's absolutely validated. We now have seven years' worth of data, more than 10 million scans around the world to be able to use that database to validate what the technology is really measuring. And let's go through that very quickly. And we have written a, a review paper 
So we have actually submitted much of those type of data uh, for peer review and, and get it into manuscripts and finally into print. And this is just an example of the significance of measuring carotenoids and how that actually translates to an indication of overall nutritional antioxidant health in the body. And fundamentally, what Les Packer from Berkeley tells us is the fact that antioxidants don't exist in isolation. For all intents and purposes, the antioxidants, if you will, once they get into the, in your body, they all come together to form almost this network that we call the antioxidant network. It's almost like weaving these antioxidants together into a fabric and it is the integrity of this antioxidant fabric in your body that governs how you can manage your oxidative stress. And if one piece of that network breaks down, the whole thing unravels. And that is why this drove us, and again I've cited one of the, uh, the, the reprints or articles that have now, has now shown that if you measure carotenoids, it's a pretty good biomarker of the overall antioxidant network status. So that's, that's what we have, and these are some of the studies that we have conducted. The first study we did was obviously to make sure that what we measure on the skin, as far as carotenoids are concerned, that it actually correlates to what people traditionally measure in the blood. And we did the correlation study, and we showed with hundreds of people, and where we can show, this is the regression coefficient, if you will, where we do this analysis, where we show what indeed we show on the skin correlated very well with what we can find in the blood. Okay? So we have clearly confirmed that. In fact, that uh, dietary carotenoids in plasma, right now, folks are still considering that as a gold standard for measuring or for monitoring dietary intake. I would argue that our scanner is a far more uh, efficient and effective way of monitoring dietary intake of anybody. Because it's non-invasive, it's quick, and we have uh, actually corroborated that it reflects what if you measure the blood carotenoids. Yale, for example, one of the uh, professors, the faculty member there working with inner city kids, they are using this Raman spectroscopic uh, method to measure dietary intake in inner city kids. So it's quite well, well validated along those lines. And we have measured vitamin C and other non-carotenoid antioxidants in plasma together with blood carotenoids and a scanner response. And we find, once again, there's pretty good correlation, giving us a very good level of confidence that when we claim that it is, a, when you measure the skin number or the skin value, that is a reflection of overall antioxidant status, that, that is a pretty accurate statement to make. And again, now this is not, we have a product obviously uh, called Life Pack, which is an antioxidant supplement. And people, many of critics have initially, when we launched the scanner, say, well, this is nothing but just a life pack detector. Not quite true. We don't bias our studies that bad. Uh, and uh, we have validated it. So let's assume, and this was the hypothesis we worked with at the very beginning, because we knew that criticism, criticism was going to come. And to say, look, what does the NIH recommend? for all intents and purposes in terms of a good diet. Inevitably, it always comes down to six to nine serving of fruits and vegetables. Why don't we use that and we screen and, and sort of choose a variety of people, uh, groups of people, where certain groups will be eating nothing, they're all meat eaters, and then going all the way to a group that consistently eats six to nine servings of fruits and vegetables. And we scan all of them. And what we find, indeed, once again, there was a good correlation that more fruits and vegetables that you eat, the better the antioxidant protection. I think it is by far the most unbiased demonstration of the scanner being a very an objective monitor. And it's not a life bag detector. And we can show this. In fact, once again, going with the hypothesis, right, that obesity has a huge impact on your oxidative stress level in the body, and it does. 
Tons of studies have been published on it. Why don't we see whether there's a correlation, what happens in these individuals as far as scanner score is concerned, and we can see what happens here that, again, as obesity goes up, or at least the BMI value goes up in, uh, in certain groups, their scanner score actually drops. There's an inverse correlation in this instance. And smoking, as we all know, induces an extremely uh, high level of oxidative stress because it generates so many free radicals in your body. And again, we can see uh, plotting for, uh, all the way from non-smokers to a heavy smoker close to a pack a day or more, you can see there is a very gradual smoking dependent drop in antioxidants in your body because the antioxidants are being used up so rapidly by the generation of these extreme levels of free radicals, you would expect a hypothesis would predict that your antioxidants will drop in a smoker. And sure enough, we managed to prove that. Then finally, this over, what does it mean? You know, at the end of the day, I get most medical professionals, they're, well, okay, fine, we believe you on the anti antioxidant side. What does it really mean? Every day I pick up, frankly, a New England Journal article and say, you take antioxidants, in fact, it's bad for you, frankly. Right? Blah, blah, blah. You pick up your, your, your BMJ or whatever medical professional, there's a review article, some people say antioxidants are bad for you. Well, fundamentally, if you look upon those lines, Okay, then really what we are saying is antioxidants are good is because they provide this clinical benefit that is related to a reduction in oxidative stress. Okay, that is really the clinical benefit link. And what we can show, in fact, if your scanner score goes up and if we measure urinary biomarkers of oxidative stress, and in this instance it's MDA, but we have measured another one that's a more robust marker called isoprostanes, uh, these two markers, they tell us that in fact the oxidative stress level or the oxidative stress status in your body overall, it does decrease when you have a higher scanner score. That reminds me to tell you, you know, you're going to ask, because many of you, particularly among the males, the scanner has become a competitive instrument and they try to compete on getting the score as high as possible. <laughs> If I have 70,000, I'm better than you at 60,000. It's not meant to be that. What fundamentally the reality with the scanner is in fact, let's just assume on the remote possibility that antioxidants are bad for you, okay? But is it always a dose-related phenomenon with any substance or any drug or anything, right? So in fact, I would argue that the scanner is actually a safety mechanism that you can guide your patients to an optimal level of antioxidant intake. Because we have plotted the scale that you're going to see for all the way from the red to the blue, that why we chose blue to be the optimal or desired level of antioxidant protection is because that blue zone, if you will, is based on that fruits and vegetables study. Okay. So we have added, if anything else, going back to the premise in your Hippocratic oath, do no harm, at the very minimum, that Biophoton is kind of offers that protection to all your patients and all the people who come to you for medical care. And this credibility is validation if you ask for it. You have so many of them, it comes out from the wazoo, and this is just sort of like, well, some of them. <laughs> and uh, the scientists have presented in all kinds of scientific conferences around the world. And uh, business awards, it, it obviously, when it first came out, it was first, uh, first in class, it's innovative, and we have garnered quite a few awards along those lines. And finally, the medical rights, we have the medical rights in 2006, and fundamentally, you know, when you look at cholesterol measuring, when you look at your diabetics, you measure their HA1C, and so on and so forth, what we are saying with the biophotonic scanner, it offers, at least on the supplementation side, an ability to measure so that you can monitor your patients on, on an objective level rather than them lying to you because all patients lie, correct? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a non-valid, is a validated, non-invasive, five minutes, put the palm on your hand, 
and you get your score. Very easy. And um, why use this system? I think this is, this is really an example. So that's really what the scan is all about. Now, we provided you a way to look at a problem. We do obviously have a solution. Not much point highlighting a problem without offering a solution. And that's where the live pack comes in. And later on, from the scientists, I'm sure you'll hear about all the things that we have done to formulate that live pack to be the most comprehensive micronutrient uh, supplement in the market today. And from then on, with that understanding, we can move to other things that we do uh, in New Skin Enterprises, uh, because when you look at us, at a $1.5 billion company, obviously we're not a one-trick pony type company, and there are lots of things that come in the future. Thank you. Thank you.